Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here. For those of you who uh, may be visiting today, thank you for coming. So glad, to, uh, glad to have you part of our worship service, and, and we certainly hope that you get something out of it uh, that, that you need on this summer Sunday morning that sometimes feels more like an autumn <laughs> Sunday morning. So. Welcome to Lake of the United Church, located near the banks of the Elbow River in the beautiful Weasel Head Conservation Area. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the indigenous peoples for whom this was once the sacred gathering ground of the buffalo and the healing place of the medicine tree, the peoples with whom Treaty 7 was signed. We recognize our responsibility as signatories to that treaty to live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Are there any announcements? I know there are somewhere. There we are. I just have two quick announcements. First of all, I want to thank whoever it is that has been bringing uh, packages of cookies. It's all very well, but uh, we now have over half a dozen full packages of cookies, which are going to be uh, not the freshest by the fall. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, and one other question about bringing goodies in, please put them in the fridge or the freezer. Uh, years ago, we had quite a little mouse problem. And they even get into packages that are closed. So please, uh, if you do donate something, fridge or freezer. Um, and uh, I had a thought uh, that uh, since we have all these cookies and no one has signed up for the 30th of June, it might be a nice idea. All that have to be done would be some coffee. Anyway, think that one over. And the second one um, <clears throat> is that um, we usually have a spring cleanup. Uh, this year it's quite late because of the garage sale and, and cleaning out the church again. Um, I have a list of a little or midland jobs that are nice to be done to freshen up the narthex, the sanctuary, and the upper hall. Um, please see me. I'm thinking of um, next um, Monday or Wednesday, not next, the 24th and the 26th of June. If people are free and are able to help, see me after church. Thank you. June is Pride Month, and uh, therefore, we are going to use the Pride Candle as our Christ Candle this week. So we gather in the light of a new day. This candle serves as a symbol of the light that we seek within ourselves and within others. It's, it's still glowing just a little bit. <laughs> Come on, Candle. You can do it. You can do it. There we go. 
There we go. There we go, Piggy. Thank you. Okay. Let's get this party started. <laughs> Would you join me in the call to worship as is printed in the bulletin and on the screen? And I guess I don't need to tell you, your part is the bold print. On a bright summer morning, while the dew is still on the grass, God is there. In a noisy prairie thunder shower, while we scramble for shelter, God is there. On a warm summer evening as we barbecue and visit with friends, God is there. In the companionship and love of Lakeview United Church, God is here. Take a breath. Take a slow, easy breath. We're going to transition from getting here to being here. So I invite you to remain seated as we sing in the quiet curve of evening.
Thing I'm, I'm so thankful for is our music director Cody and how when we just sang that song through one of the verses he, he just played only a few notes and let us really worship in a special way and what a gift thank you would you pray with me the prayer that is printed in your bulletin and on the screen O Holy One, we welcome your presence among us in this sacred space on this sacred day. May our worship time together be blessed with comfort, encouragement, and joy. Speak to us through the words of the faithful writers of ancient times. Grant us understanding of the message we are meant to hear today. May we give voice to our faith in the hymns that we sing and the prayers that we pray. We ask these things in love and in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing, Come Touch Our Hearts.
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about, before we get to our first reading here, let's go back a few, a few books in the, in the Old Testament. God called Abraham to start a new community. And then sometime later, God called Moses to free that community from enslavement. And God's community of Israel lived under a governance model that we could call theocracy, where God was in charge. And when Samuel became the leader of this, this people, that's how he led. He was a prophet. He was a priest. He was a military leader. And when Samuel got old, and it was time for a change in leadership, the elders of Israel came to him with a request about change in how leadership would be done with this group of people. And Samuel, being the prophet that he was, prayed about it, had a word with God, and God uh, offered a stern warning uh, to him to pass on to the elders of Israel about their uh, request. So we'll let Peggy read the, the story for us. Good morning. <clears throat> Speaking, uh, reading uh, Samuel 8, 4 to 20. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out to Egypt to this day, forsaking me, and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war, and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, and cooks, and bakers. He will take the rest of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the king refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. <clears throat> Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and they renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, 
and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and then and there Saul and the Israelites rejoiced greatly. Thanks, Peggy. Now our gospel reading this morning comes from uh, the Gospel of Mark. And the author of Mark has a, a literary technique that is used quite frequently in Mark where he tells a story within a story. And this is often referred to as a Markan sandwich where you have one story, the beginning of which comes here, the end of which is here, and then tucked in the middle, a second story. And this morning's story is like that. We have a, it's a story about, uh, it talks a little bit about Jesus' family, the beginning and the end, and then in the middle part, talks a little bit about the religious authorities, familiar theme, this happens throughout the Gospels, religious authorities challenging Jesus and his response to them. So Mark three twenty to 35. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first trying up the strong man. Tying up, sorry. Then in, indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never forgiveness. But is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, You mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around them, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Bless these words from the Holy Spirit.
Thank you, Cody and choir. <clears throat> You know, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week or the week before, when when uh, I wasn't in the pulpit, but Clint was, and he he said he wasn't sure if he had a title for his sermon. And now I look at this title that that I chose for this: "Who or What Rules Your Life." I, at the time, I prepared the bullet, and I thought that was the right title because we're going to speak about, from, from the Samuel reading that we just heard, about who's, who's going to govern these people of Israel. Is it going to be God or a king, or, or how is that going to work? So that's kind of where, where I want to go with it. At the si same time, though, where, where I'm hoping that it can end up by the end of this sermon is, is kind of a, along the lines of the cult of worship where we said God is there, God is there, God is here, and then the, and then the hymn we sang in the quiet curve of evening, you are there, you are there. So if, if I don't put you completely to sleep in this talk, we'll, we will gradually get to a place of where is God, which we talked about back in May as well. So, but first of all, Let's, let's continue our little history conversation and go back to the time when Israel had escaped from Egypt. And the Philistines had migrated to the region about the same time. And now from their cities near the Mediterranean coast, they were gradually pushing deeper into the mountains of Israel. And they had superior weapons, chariots in particular. And though they were less populous than Israel, they were apparently better organized because Israel had neither central administration nor a regular army. They were a loose confederation of 12 tribes who called on each other for help only in emergencies. And the nation had worked that way for well over 100 years, and the tribes seemed too independent to change. But the Philistines were pressing them in a crisis of leadership, a crisis testing the very existence of Israel was building, and a new leader was needed. God chose Samuel. And you remember readings from earlier in Samuel, you know, uh, here I am, God called Samuel, Samuel, yes, here I am. And in today's reading, we picked up the story when Samuel was at the end of his period of leadership and the elders wanted a change and they asked for a king like other nations. And they chose Saul. The people chose Saul, at least according to the text we read. And that didn't work out very well for them. And we'll pick that story up next week when they decide they gotta have a different king because Saul wasn't the one. And next week we'll get into the story of how David became the king. So that's for next Sunday. But for now, let's unpack the story so far and see if we can put it into a 21st century context. And like to me, what it's saying to me this week, how the text is speaking to me, is it's about governance. Who's in charge? And in Samuel's day, Israel was governed by a theocracy, where God was in charge. Samuel was the human kind of leader of, of these tribes. But Samuel always went to God and prayed about it, and, and then came back and said, this is, this is how God wants things to be done. So any decision to be made was, was really God's decision, at least in Samuel's mind it was. Egypt, on the other hand, was a monarchy governed by Pharaoh. 
And the other nations, quote, other nations that were spoken about in the reading were also monarchies. The text says the elders asked Samuel, appoint, they want to appoint a king to govern us like other nations. And in today's world, we have a variety of governance models. Three common systems that come to my mind are monarchy, dictatorship, and democracy. And there's various versions of all of those. There's, there's a monarchy where the monarch is absolute ruler. I think Saudi Arabia might be an example. Then you have constitutional monarchy like the UK, Netherlands, Canada to a certain extent. And then you have dictatorships, which is kind of like monarchy, only it's a, a different kind of absolute leadership and democracy and variety of models of democracy. And I, I stand to be corrected, but I personally am not aware of any nation, province, state, or municipality today that lives within a governance system of theocracy where God is in charge. I'm not aware of any corporation that runs that way or workplace, political party, not-for-profit organization that is governed by God. And I'm not sure if even churches are governed by God. We think we are, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I can't speak for other churches, Christian or otherwise, but I can tell you that here in Lakeview United Church, I believe we could do a better job of letting God be our leader. I've served on your governing body here for a number of years in a variety of capacities. And yes, we pray at the beginning of each council meeting asking God to guide us in our deliberations and conversations. But when it comes down to it, I sort of have the sense that our decisions made at our congregational council are based on what we think is best for the church or what we imagine you might think is best for the church. And seldom do I hear someone ask, what do you think God wants us to do? You know, we've talked about, oh, let's have a straw poll and ask the congregation, what do they think about this question or that question? And we're not quite like Samuel in saying, okay, God, what, what do you want us to do? You know, one time, a uh, number of many years ago, I, I was in a different United Church, and we had a men's group that met for breakfast on a Saturday morning once a month, and we usually had a guest speaker. And one month we had a, a gentleman who was a Quaker. And it was kind of interesting. Like before he spoke, we had our breakfast, and then we had a little bit of a, a meeting as a men's group. It wasn't much of a meeting, but we, we had to make a couple of decisions, one of which was uh, about uh, a men's barbecue we were going to put on on Father's Day Sunday or something that, where the men would you know, do this thing. And so we, we had a meeting and we had a motion and we took notes and all that. And then when the guest speaker, who was a Quaker, got up to speak, he said, wow, <clears throat> it's been a long time since I've been in a, a church where they had motions and seconds to motions and votes and so on. And, and he told us that in their, in their church, when the elders or whoever is the governing body meets to decide on, on an issue, they sit in a circle and they state the issue and then they pray. And quite possibly silently, and then they discuss and they pray some more. And, they, and the decision isn't made until everybody in the circle believes with all their heart that this is a God's decision. And it's a, a little different than the way I've seen it done in, in, in United Church and Lakeview United Church. So I'm not sure if we are governed in a theocracy. 
Now let's, let's take the conversation down another level from, from a congregation level to a personal level, you and, and me. And hence the title of my sermon, what, what rules or governs your life? Is it God or, or something else? Um, let me tell you a, a little, another little brief story. When I was in Toastmasters, I was mentoring a young man for a short period who was from Pakistan. And we were having coffee in our mentorship meeting, and he, he shared with me uh, how he came to be married. And he was, he was a young gentleman in his mid-20s or so, had, had a one child, married with one child. And, uh, he was a really, really nice guy and, and very happy and always smiling and, and so on. And he explained to me about the, in his culture, in his country, the, the practice of arranged marriages, which is totally unfamiliar to me and scary to me because I grew up in, in our culture. And he said, well, of course my parents chose my bride for me. Who better to help me with the most important decision of my life than the people who love me the most and care for me the most? And it started to make sense to me. Now I understand if this is why people in that culture have that that practice, I got it then. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. So I'm going to suggest for me, and you and me, if, if you're interested, is, is maybe we could consider having God be the CEO of our life. And who better to help us with the important decisions in our life than the one who loves us the most, the one who created us, gave us this life and wants what's best for us. I believe God loves me and wants what's best for me. So I'm just about ready to wrap up here, and I just want to leave you with a, a thought. Leaders come and leaders go. In biblical times, we read about that throughout the Old Testament, how leaders come and leaders go and a new leader is chosen, and we're going to get into that more next week. But if there's one thing I believe about God, it's this. God is constant. God doesn't come and go. God is constant. We sang about that. You're there, you're there in the quiet curve of evening. God was there when I was born. God was with me when I was a 12-year-old boy, brokenhearted at the loss of his grandmother. God was with me when I caught my first fish. God was with me when my first son was born and when he died. God was with me when my beloved Peggy and I first prayed together on the banks of the Bow River on October 22, 2000. God was with me through my first and second cancer diagnoses and subsequent treatments. God was with me and Peggy through both of her cancer diagnoses and treatments. God was with us through all the good and bad times in our life, the kidney disease, the anemia, the, all of those times, God was with us. And when I, when I inevitably leave this body and this world behind, as I surely will, I believe with all my heart that God will be with me and that I will continue to live in some way, I know not which way, but in some way, I will continue to live with God forever because God is constant. 
And I believe the very same things about you. In this, as in all things, glory be to God. Now we're going to stand and sing a song that summarizes what I just said. I was there to hear your morning cry. As we start the prayers of the people, I'm going to ask, seeing as everybody did such a beautiful job singing that hymn, Come Touch Our Hearts, I'm going to use that hymn as the fourth verse as a response for our prayers of the people, if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. I'm ahead of myself. We'll now go for the presentation of our offerings.
Generous God, we return to you a portion of what you have so generously given us. Even as we give, we seek you and your blessing. Accept these gifts and us and cause them and us to be a blessing to others. We ask these things in love and in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was saying earlier, <laughs> um, what I'd like to do during the prayers of the people is to use the fourth verse of that beautiful hymn we sang together earlier, Come Touch Our Hearts. So I'm just going to give a minute to Silas and our AV team there to find it. And maybe we can just have a quick sing through once they've got it up on the screen. God, what a mess we are in. The news is full of wars and conflict. So many people are dying under threat or displaced from their homes. We see strong victimizing the weak who have no recourse. Strong and mighty God, help us in our broken world. Come touch our hearts. country and in this province, we see health care systems close to collapse, burnt out teachers in crowded classrooms, and politicians pointing fingers and making personal attacks. Strong and mighty God, help us. Come touch our hearts. We have worries about our climate, about fire and drought. The last four days, we've been trying to avoid using water and have more water scarcity to come as the city sorts out its water systems. Come touch our hearts. Remember all who are struggling with finances, relationships, or health. In a moment's silence, let us bring to mind those who need support.
Come touch our hearts. Let's hear God's promise from the end of Psalm 91. Because they have set their love upon me, I will deliver them. I will uphold them because they know my name. When they call to me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and bring them to honor. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my saving power. Come touch our hearts. Can you join me now in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
you say with me the commissioning that is printed in your bulletin and on the screen? As we leave this place of worship, may the Spirit of God be our guide, leading us to see the blessings that come our way and be a blessing to those we meet. And as you leave this place, take with you the blessing of God who made you, Jesus who came for you, and the Spirit who will never leave you. Go in peace. Amen.